Abraham to Jacob. And here we'll, talk, we'll see a bit of the personal and the national combined. So a Jacob leaves home. Why? He cheated his brother. Okay, now we're getting into family stuff. And probably none of y'all have family stuff, so you can go to the bathroom, do whatever you need to do, take an extra break. Uh, so you can read the Jacob cycle in Genesis 25 uh, to 35. But here are a couple of highlights. We're, we're going to go through uh, some stuff that relates to the New Testament. All right, so Jacob uh, leaves because, as you just said, he has cheated his brother Esau out of his birthright. So he has to leave home. And you remember, what, um, you remember that Jacob and Esau are twins. And you remember in the womb, what does Jacob do? Right? Jacob's always what? He's the grabber. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this, this is Jacob. So well, I thought his mother, there's his mother. I mean, we're getting into serious family stuff. How many counselors are in the room? Do we have psychiatry? Raise your hand if you're a counselor. One counselor out of this whole group? Okay, wow. Well, you're going to be very busy at lunchtime. Uh, okay, so Jacob leaves Beersheba and goes towards Haran. We know Haran because uh, from the earlier stories of Abraham. He came to a certain place and stayed there for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And the Lord stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. And your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever I go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob woke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I didn't know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, Bethel, Beit El. And this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning, and he took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on the top of it. He called that place Bethel, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Right. If you know John chapter 1, 151, John tells us <clears throat> this about uh, Jesus. Nathaniel uh, is talking to Jesus. He says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You see the connection? So Bethel is a really important place from the Old Testament that carries, gets carried into the New Testament and becomes metaphorical. Does that make sense? So this is Jacob's ladder in John 1, 51. If you're reading John 1, 51, if you're just in your hotel, you're picking up your Gideon's Bible, you've never seen John before, you're reading before bedtime, you come to it, right? It sounds interesting and weird and kind of mystical, okay. But once you've read the Old Testament and start to understand the theological importance of place names, you can go to a second layer of understanding the Gospel of John and who Jesus is. Because of course in a few chapters, he'll be at Jacob's well with the woman of Samaria having a conversation where she says, you're not greater than our father Jacob, are you? And it turns out he is, right? He's also greater than Moses. He's greater than everything and everybody uh, in the Gospel of John. 
But the things make more sense when you understand the metaphorical, theological meaning behind the, uh, the geography of it. So house of God. It's also tied to the fact, right? So you see John attaching this story to Jacob's story where he names the place Bethel, house of God. You also remember Jesus is going to get in trouble. Because in John 2, he says, tear down this temple. What? And in three days, I'll raise it up. Because Jesus also becomes the locust. I mean, in, for John and for, for Christians, Jesus is the locus of God. The, the place where God is in the place, right? Where God is encountered. And so what will happen in a book like the Gospel of John is everything that matters in the Old Testament gets drawn in. People, places, geography, land. It all gets drawn in and applied onto Jesus. The meaning finds its fulfillment, so to speak, for this author in Jesus. And you, can't, you can understand at a certain level, but the more you understand what's going on in the Old Testament, the more it then will inform what's going on here. So that is one time God speaks to Jacob, is when he's leaving the land. And he's leaving because Jacob's being Jacob. He got himself in this situation for the way he acts, right? Lying, he's what you would call crooked in a way, right? And that becomes important um, in a moment. Because he comes home, so what I just read to you is from Genesis 28, 10 through 19. Right? So the importance of Bethel, house of God, Jacob, leaving his land to become a foreigner. He comes home again, and this is really the only other time God speaks to Jacob. When he leaves the land and when he comes back to the land. So I want to look through Genesis uh, 32 and 33, because it's a, a fascinating story, I think, of family and home and place. So what we hear is uh, in Genesis 32 and 33, so he goes on his way, and the angels of God meet him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. And so he called that place Mahanaim. So again, that's another example of how things get named. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my lord Esau. So, right, Jacob's trying to come home again. How, how do you imagine Esau feels about Jacob coming home? Right? I mean, what are some of the emotions you think Esau might be feeling? Anger? Resentment? Rage? Right? What are some of the emotions Jacob might be feeling? Fear? Embarrassment? Shame? Right? I mean, now we are in family. Right? And we're going to watch, watch how this works out. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien. It's a recurring theme in scripture about being a stranger, a foreigner, alien. And stayed until now. And I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male, female, slaves. I've sent to tell my lord in order that I might find favor in your sight. So the messengers come back to Jacob and they say, we came to your brother Esau, he's coming to meet you. And 400 men are with him. <laughs> then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. And he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies, thinking if Esau comes to one company and destroys it, then the company that is left will escape. It's always Jacob. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O Lord who said to me, Return to your country and to your kindred, and I will do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all the steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I crossed this Jordan. And now I have become two companies. Deliver me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I'm afraid of him. He may come and kill us all. The mothers with the children. Yet you have said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted because of their number. Okay. <laughs> so he spent that night there. And 
from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau, 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, a bunch of stuff. All right, these he delivered into the hand of his servants, each drove by itself, and he said to his servants, pass on ahead of me and put a space <laughs> between drove and drove. He instructed the foremost, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong? Where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you will say, they belong to your servant Jacob. They are a present sent to my lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you meet him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterwards... I shall see his face. Hold on to that. Afterwards, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed uh, on ahead of him, and he himself spent that night in the camp. That same night, he got up and took his two wives, his two maids, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. Okay, so the river Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise, everything that he had. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go. And this is the same Jacob who in the womb did what? See? So now he says, let me go. For the day is breaking. But Jacob said, um, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So he said to him, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans and have prevailed. So the very name of the land of Israel comes from this. Okay, Jacob's struggle um, with God. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, because El means God, and the first part of the word means face, right? He called the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip, Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is in the hip socket, because he struck Jacob on the hip socket at the thigh muscle. Now, Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, and 400 men with him. So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two maids. He put the maids with their children in front. <laughs> then Leah with her children. And Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, until he came near his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him, and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. When Esau looked up and saw the women and children, he said, Who are these with you? Jacob said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maids drew near, they and their children bowed down. Leah likewise, her children drew near and bowed down. And finally Joseph and Rachel drew near, and they bowed down. Esau said, what do you mean by all this company that I met? <laughs> Jacob answered, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. Jacob said, no, please, if I find favor with you, then accept my present from my hand. For truly, to see your face is like seeing the face of God. Since you have received me with such favor... Please accept my gift that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have everything I want. So he urged him and he took it. Then Esau says, let us journey on our way and I'll go alongside you. But Jacob said to him, my Lord knows that the children are frail and the flocks and herds which are nursing are care to me. And if they're overdriven for one day, all the flocks will die. I mean, what's Jacob, what's happening here? He's yeah. Okay. Jacob still isn't, um, he's still not there, right? And here's Esau uh, wanting to come alongside him. And Jacob still um, 
He was afraid and not quite at home with, with things. Uh, Let my Lord pass on ahead of his servant, and I will lead on slowly across to the pace of the cattle, according to the pace of the cattle that are before me, and according to the pace of the children, blah, 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 blah. Okay, till I come to my Lord and Sire. So Esau said, well, let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, why should my Lord be so kind to me? So Esau returned that day on his way to Sire, but Jacob journeyed where? To Sukkot. See, so he doesn't actually go. And he built himself a house and made booths for his cattle. Therefore, the place is called Sukkot. Jacob came safely to the city of Shechem, which is in the land of Canaan, on his way from Padan Aram, and he camped before the city. And from the sons of Hamor, Shechem's father, he bought for 100 pieces of money the plot of land on which he pitched his tent. There he erected an altar and called it El Elohei Israel. Right? So uh, this uh, area uh, in, is in Samaria, so where Jacob ends up. And again, you'll then see it when we get to John chapter 4 and Jacob's well. So we, we talked about Abraham, who never really quite figures out his relationship to the land. It's not his homeland. Uh, Jacob was actually born in the land. So he's interest, an interesting character because in some ways you would feel like Jacob would be someone who ends up having resolved the issue of land and home. So a couple of comments I want to make extra about this story. So you said that Jacob feels shame because he stole the birthright. Uh, also, he wasn't there. I mean, tell me, you know, you have family. This also means while he was off, stole the birthright, went off, who was there when the parents got old and needed caring for? And who wasn't there? It involves a lot of things, right? The sense of home and not. There's the fear and the guilt. Remember, Esau is his twin. And so this language of face to face is not accidental, right? You can imagine to some degree when Jacob looks into the face of Esau, Jacob, to some degree, has to see a reflection of what Jacob could have been if Jacob didn't always act like Jacob. In a way that I imagine looking into the face of another sibling who's not a twin, you see the rhetorical, psychological um, effect of that story. It's also the case that the name Israel comes from, um, and you can debate this, because rabbis play very, very, um, in a really fun way with language and roots and all of that. So the, the verb y yashar or yesar um, that Israel comes from means straight. So Jacob, who is very crooked, gets a new name right, that is tied to the meaning of straight. It's also tied to the meaning of the verb to struggle and to fight. Jacob, who in the womb already kind of lived in the world this way. So his, his name Jacob has a crooked meaning, right? And so part of what coming home, these are real geographical places, so understanding the history of the Judeo-Christian heritage, that's one thing. There's also a whole other layer in these stories about what it means um, to come home. And part of coming home probably means for Jacob, um, he has to grow up and he has to learn to become a, a straight shooter and a man of truth if he is going to become kind of the man he was born to be. So the touching the leg that God does uh, recalls Jacob grabbing Esau's heel. Jacob can never really feel like he is at home because he was gone so long. Most likely, it's his home and it's not his home. He has to relearn how to live into the, in that land. He had to learn how to deal with his family relationships before he can settle. Again, notice God speaks to Jacob two times, when he leaves the land and when he comes back home. So I think it's interesting because to this day, when you're talking about this figure in the Bible, what do you call him? How do you refer to his name? Jacob. So it's kind of funny that he was renamed Israel, but we still actually call him Jacob. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you'll hear sons, and we'll see in Exodus, he gets referred to the sons of Israel go with Jacob. 
So Jacob ends up being a fascinating biblical character to me, and it partially has to do with geography and land and the psychology, the inner terrain of the human soul, right? Um, the, the kind of that aspect of it, because in a way, he, he never fully also kind of resolves um, uh, all of his issues the way that you would uh, expect, right? And it may be, you know, why? It may be that it takes a generation, because later people refer to him as Israel, you know, or sons of Israel. And it may be it takes a generation to go from being crooked to straight shooting. Um, these things can take time, right? Uh, Pharaoh refers to them as the sons of, uh, of Israel. Um, so um, take, I want you to take two minutes and turn to your neighbor and talk a little bit about so we talked, we've looked at Abraham, now we've looked at Jacob, we've looked at family, we've looked at politics, nation forming, etc. So spend a couple of minutes talking about this notion of home, like where it resonates with you or not. What makes home home? So I'll give you two minutes to talk to your neighbor about what makes home home? What makes a promised land home? couple of insights or observations you all came up with in reading these stories. What's percolating in your brain? So home, is it a place? Is it a, or is it, is it more than one thing at once? Because so um, in the book of Revelation, throughout scripture, the language of Zion is used. And we're going to sing uh, marching to Zion a little later for obvious reasons. It will become obvious. So Zion is a very interesting place that's a real geographical place. Right, but it's also very metaphorical. And what's interesting is Zion is often depicted as Mother Jerusalem. So Zion is synonymous with Jerusalem in some ways. And, and is, um, she's a mother dandling the baby on her knee uh, kind of thing. So even you can even talk about, you know when I talked about the Adama and the creation from the earth, Adama is a feminine noun. And, and rabbis love to just play with these things. It's a little loosey-goosey. But Adama is feminine, so there's you'll find rabbis talking about like the the birth mother mother earth we talk about mother earth right and so in that way um, so this this maternal language gets factored into this in our own lives but also in in scripture as well yeah good right and whether it's based on geography whether it's based on your people group whether it's based on tri family tribal connections um, Etc. But what you th see throughout Scripture is a real attention to it and the importance of it for human beings, politically, but all the way down into the soul. Yeah. So anyway, if we have more time, we could kind of pursue that. But I wanted you to think about that a bit. So this gets us then um, the story of Jacob then gets us over into um, the Exodus. We're going to move into the Exodus. Um, so with Exodus, who's the major figure for us from Exodus? Moses, all right? So when you're talking about the date here, you're around 1300 BCE. Uh, the place, if you're talking ge geography, right, you're now talking uh, uh, Egypt and the wilderness. So uh, Exodus opens, the book of Exodus opens with Jacob and Joseph. Exodus 1.1 says, These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob each with his household, and then it names the 12 tribes, basically. The total number of people born to Jacob was 70. Uh, Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, all his brothers, and that whole generation. But the Israelites were fruitful and prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who didn't know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase... And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from that land. Very interesting. They're now home, in a way, the Israelites in Egypt, uh, but not, not trusted uh, in this way. Okay, so enter Moses. He leads his people out of Egypt towards the Promised Land. Obviously, he looms large in the New Testament. I find him an especially enigmatic figure when it comes to geography and theology and home. He is born and raised in Egypt. It's the only land he knows. He's born in Pharaoh's house. He's not born in Pharaoh's house, but he gets there pretty quickly. He has two moms. He has a Hebrew mom, 
a kind of Hebrew identity, and he has a surrogate mom. So, so you know, in a way, the promised land is his one land, and Egypt, his surrogate mother in, Pharaoh, in Pharaoh's house, Egypt is his surrogate mother, if you want to put it that way. Um, so you could say Egypt is his home, but then the question quickly becomes, is it his home? Uh, and in this way, this is the gift and challenge of every bicultural person, I think. Uh, and that is, he's Egyptian, and he's also Hebrew. At one and the same time, equally so. He's not this or that, he's both this and that. Notice how quickly he goes from being considered a citizen to a foreigner. He grew up in Pharaoh's household. It doesn't get any more assimilated, I think, than that. But when push comes to shove, the host country uh, kind of turns on Moses, at least his people, and Moses himself becomes other in his own country because he has ties to more than one group. So he ends up in Midian. Right? So again, Moses is born in Egypt, but here we go again. He's leaving. He ends up in Midian, and so in Exodus 2, 15 to 22, we hear this. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh. He settled in the land of Midian, because, you know, Moses did that thing where he killed the Egyptian. Um, the priest of Midian had seven daughters, so, so he sits down by a well. This becomes important in John 4. What happens at wells in the Old Testament? Marriage. Right? This always happens. Um, okay, and that metaphor is going on in John chapter 4 as well. The betrothal thing, because you remember Jesus is the bridegroom in the Gospel of John. So all these Old Testament wells are important when you get into the New Testament. The priest of Midian had seven daughters. They came to draw water, filled the troughs to water their father's flock. But some shepherds came and drove them away. Moses got up and came to their defense and watered their flock. When they returned to their father, Ruel, he said, How is it you've come back so soon today? And they said... An Egyptian, this is Moses, the leader, right? An Egyptian helped us against the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, where is he? Why'd you leave the man? Invite him to break bread. Moses agreed to stay with the man, and he gave Moses his daughter, um, Zipporah, in marriage. Um, another topic for another day. Uh, she bore a son and named him Gershom. Why did she name him Gershom? For he said, I have been an alien residing in a foreign land. That's from Exodus 2, uh, 15 to 22. Now, Gershom is Moses' first son. According, so, um, so the name means a sojourner there. So Ger is a sojourner. What does it mean? Again, if we're adding layers to our conversation, what does it mean that Moses is an alien residing in a foreign land in this story? Is home Egypt for Moses? Or is the promised land home for, for you know, Moses? He never makes it to the promised land, but you know, what is home? What does it mean that he's a foreigner there? The whole story of Moses takes place outside of the promised land, just as does the story of Jacob. So again, I asked you in an email, some of you received the email, as a Christian, I'd really love for you to think about what the notion of promised land means and whether it's an, a meaningful category to you and to your church community. So that in the Exodus, Moses leaves his homeland for the promised land, but he never gets to it. So again, there's that theme that I tried to start out with, of some kind of theme of utopia. There's this, no, this notion that there, it's a, a, a no place, you know, this place toward which you're, you're moving. There's an idealized image of geography. Um, okay, so you have uh, the Exodus. We're going to move from that. You get the Israelites moving into the promised land, um, and if you read... Uh, here in Deuteronomy 1.8, the promise gets fulfilled at the end of the Exodus from Egypt in Deuteronomy 1.8. It says this, See, I have given you this land. Go in and take possession of the land that the Lord swore he would give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to their descendants after them. I've been trying to plot this out for you to, to see all these pieces of this developing. So they get into the promised land. Okay, we don't have time for them to stay there long, so we're going to go into exile. Um, so in the 6th century BCE, 
right? Then Israel, uh, there's the Babylonian exile, right? The beginning of the 6th century uh, BCE. Uh, Babylon is import important to us again, like I said. It's real and it's metaphorical uh, in Jewish and Christian theology. Uh, if we had more time, I would play for you the song from Godspell. I would pull up iTunes and play On the Willows there. If you, so if you know that, you can sing it while I read this psalm that it comes from. Psalm 137, 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps. For there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundation. O daughter Babylon, you devastator. Happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rocks. Okay? There's a psalm for one of your bad days. Might want to mark that one with a post-it note, a neon color. <laughs> okay, so, so when you hear the word Babylon, after you read something like this, is it a thumbs up or a thumbs down? Right? So Babylon is, becomes mythic language for Jews and Christians of an occupying force, um, oppressive force, etc. So, uh, yeah, it also shows in this psalm a very conflicted relationship with what counts as home, right? Because tons of Jews are born into Babylon. That's the only place they've ever known is being born in Babylon. The question becomes, where do I belong? Of course, this theme is writ large. If we were all Jews in here and talking just about Jewish history, we would talk about this theme throughout history. What does it mean um, for a Jew to be home? Uh, if you've been to Israel, how many of you have been to Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Museum in Israel? So it is a, an incredibly powerful experience um, and will help you think through uh, what does it mean? You know, am I a German or am I a Jew? Am I a Russian or am I a Jew? Uh, that, that whole language. So with the Babylonian exile, you get the beginning of what we call the diaspora, D I A. S-P-O-R-A, diaspora, which is literally the word for scattering. So seed, the word spore. In English, we have the word spore, right? And dia means through. Like, that's dia, that's the scattering part. So diaspora. And, and, you know, it's obviously a Christian, I mean, a Jewish term. But also, you'll see this language of diaspora, a sense of not being home or not being permanently home and the language of exile that Christians then adopt. One place that you can see this is 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1, uh, and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the exiles of the diaspora. This is a Christian writing to Christians. Not a, right? To the exiles of the diaspora in Pontus, Galatia, uh, we're in this area now, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen and destined by God the Father and sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in abundance. So you see that language in 1 Peter. Maybe you don't hang out in 1 Peter that often, so now I will have the proud privilege of saying I got you to look at 1 Peter um, and to remember that it's there. The author of Revelation picks up on all of this symbolic geographical language, casting Rome in the role of Babylon. So anytime you see Babylon, when you're reading the book of Revelation, it's not literally Babylon, it's Rome. Why would the author do this? Why would the author make Babylon symbolic of Rome? What are, go ahead, blurt out. A foreign oppressor, right, who does not share the same values and convictions and make deci decisions based on the same set of moral 
considerations, right? So, you know, sometimes people say, well, Revelation is just, you know, using it because uh, they're being subversive and they're using coded language so that Rome, you know, doesn't understand. First of all, Rome's not reading Revelation. They don't care uh, what Christians are saying or thinking. They don't really care what anybody's saying or thinking. So, I mean, I don't want to be too dismissive of it. I think everybody should brainstorm all the possibilities. But also, John is already exiled on Potmos. So he's already uh, on the radar screen of Rome. And the fact that he's exiled instead of executed means he's a person of some social means. Because same thing then as it is now, certain people get executed, certain people get exiled. Um, right? Depending on your social class and connections. Um, so, um, you know, it's not about that. It's, it's not at all John trying to be nice and hide from Rome and not worry about Rome. John's on fire against empire. Right? He does not countenance the value system, the destructiveness, and, and it's picking up on this psalm. Babylon, you devastator. Right? And he goes on to show how destructive uh, Rome is and to inform Christians to not be involved with all of that and to acknowledge how incredibly tempting it is uh, to be involved in it. It's a lot more fun than being martyred and things like that. Um, so... Uh, Revelation then casts Rome in the role of Babylon, and simultaneously, so if Babylon is the place of exile in the Psalms and some of the other stuff we've looked at, where is home for the Israelite Zion or Jerusalem, which are synonyms, and you will also then find that in Revelation. Babylon is the oppressive force, and we're, as we'll sing in the hymn, marching to Zion. You know, is it literal or metaphorical? Interesting point to say. Um, for some, it was literal. Some Jews, when Cyrus, if you read in Isaiah, Suffering Servant Song of Isaiah 53 that we hear every Holy Week, um, by his wounds you have been healed, uh, that all comes from Second Isaiah. And it's actually referring to Cyrus, the leader who um, lets Jews go back home. But what's interesting, do they all go home? In fact, the vast majority do not go home. And Babylon becomes, ironically, a center of Jewish life and culture to the point that even today there are two Talmuds that exist in the world. So a Talmud, the Talmud is, is basically the scripture of Jewish folks. They do read the Bible, but really what they study, their equivalent of the Bible is, what we, is the Talmud. They study this document, this text of layers of years of interpretation of biblical texts. And there's two sets of them, the Palestinian Talmud and the Babylonian Talmud. Guess, is the, guess which one is the one that matters and is the one that actually gets used? The Babylonian Talmud, which is fascinating and ironic how all of that works. So the place of exile actually becomes a place of home in, a, in an odd way. Um, so that uh, becomes important, the Babylon. And in Matthew, it's kind of interesting. We're going to turn to Matthew uh, here in a minute. So when Matthew starts out his own gospel, you hear things like this, because Matthew starts out famously with what? Without even looking, you know how it starts. What does it start with? A genealogy, which you're like, oh my gosh, it's so boring. Who cares? Let's get through this. What are all these names? How do I pronounce them? Please don't make me read this at church on Sunday. Um, yeah, if you're ever asked to read Matthew 1, do not go up there. First of all, you should never be reading scripture without having practiced and rehearsed repeatedly before you stand up. And so, I mean, I mean it for real, because, I mean, it's the, it's the word of God, you know, and uh, so to stand up, I mean, we want to give it that kind of reverence and preparation. And, but especially, if you're asked to read Matthew 1, you better do your homework, because you're in big trouble. Um, so, it's interesting, though, because the way he divides it up, if you look, I'm not going to read through the whole thing, um, but even in Matthew 1.11, Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. Then you read the next verse. And after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of etc., um, etc., goes through. And then Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called the Messiah. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon... 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. 
So you, you see where I'm getting at? So I know this seems like a long thing, but the point is you have to kind of do it this way because this is actually how the canon works itself. And so by the time you get to the New Testament, all of our authors, I mean the Old Testament people are authors too, but they're drawing on everything that came before them in Scripture. And it's all there and ready for the taking and ready for the using in terms of articulating who we think God is, who we think we are, what we think we're doing when we do church, what we think we're doing when we do missions. Because, for instance, Jews, Ju Judaism is not a proselytizing religion. It's actually really, really hard to convert to Judaism. You have to be extremely serious, not like us. We'll be like, yeah, sure. Yeah, which I'm not dissing us, but I'm just saying it's pretty easy to become a Christian. It is. And it's easy to become one. I don't know if it's easy to be one, but, um, uh, you know, for the rest of your life. But it's easy to kind of sign on. Um, you know, Judaism is not a proselytizing religion. Christianity is. And we could talk about that. You're like, oh, no, now she's being a Baptist. It's getting scary. Um, I understand you're all saved, even though you're not Baptist. Um, at least on my best days, I understand it. I try to understand it. Um, so, but Christianity is a proselytizing religion and does have um, this kind of world. It, so it's interesting. It's a global phenomenon, but it's very rooted in very particular history and geography that came before it. So we see it especially in Matthew and Revelation. I wanted to, to highlight those, um, those two things. So when allowed to go back, uh, not all the Jews did. Uh, they had to decide what their relationship would be with their host culture. And I use the word host culture um, I like it. I'm a military brat. And uh, so are there other military brats in the room? That's impossible. It's just us, me and Kala? Wow, okay. So did you ever live overseas? No. Okay, so um, I, my dad's in the Navy. And so whenever we would move to a, a new place, you would take a class called Host Nation as a kid. And so we moved to Bermuda when I was 10. So I had a class on host nation. You learn everything you know, about that, that place, its culture, um, its history, et cetera. And I really carry that with me now as a Christian because I think it's a really good metaphor for me for how I'm a Christian in the world, right? The question becomes, what am I in any given country? Am I American? Am I German? Whatever. Am I Christian? And how do those two things relate? And so for myself, I tend to always think wherever I am, I'm in a host nation. So insofar as the host nation coheres with what I take being a Christian means, then I'm all in as a model citizen. Um, when the Christianity comes into conflict with the values of the host nation, that's where you have an issue. And you can decide more if you're, you know, Australian or Christian or, or whatever. Right? But that's the kind of uh, thing that we have to, to figure out. Um, so our, same thing with your, like your friends who are Jewish. You know, they're Americans. Are they Americans or are they Jewish? Uh, some Jews stay in the di diaspora then and some stay in the diaspora now. Some return back. Uh, so that is a question that comes up in Acts, by the way, when the apostles ask the governing authorities who keep telling them, you need to shut up and stand down and stop doing what you're doing. And they say to the governing authorities, what? What do they say? They ask this question, whom shall we obey, right? God or emperor? Do we obey God or do we obey, obey um, uh, people? And the fact that they're all in prison all the time um, answers the question for you, <laughs> right? And Paul himself spends a, a lot of time in prison. So there you go. There's your role models uh, when, you, when you have to make your make your decision. So this is the world then. So Revelation uses the language of Babylon because Rome is of course the occupying force in Palestine, uh, first of all, but Rome obviously is the occupying force of the world at the time. It is an invading imperial force that dislocates lots of people. Um, so some Jews, as I said, return to the land. Uh, they're invaded, occupied by Rome, by the Seleucids, then Bottom line is, in 63 BC, Pompey comes from Rome, and they become the occupiers. This land has been occupied like, all the time, this little strip of land in the Middle East. So this is the world, occupied Palestine, uh, into which Jesus is born in 4 CE. So he is a Galilean. He lives in the northern part of the country. He is a Galilean uh, operating in an occupied 
territory. That's the end of the Old Testament.